Welcome and thank you for choosing to be here with Shaping Tomorrow's Technology, Navigating, Cloud Native, Serverless, and Polyglot Programming while you had all the other choices today. No, literally, there are a lot of choices today. Um, I'm Nena Singh, I'm Product Manager at Red Hat and Knative Steering Committee member. And today with me, I have my esteemed colleague and friend, Shaf Sayed. Yeah, so, well, my name is Shaf Sayed. <laughs> um, well, I'm a, I'm a developer. I've been developing for many years. I'm also an editor at InfoQ and excited to share some uh, knowledge with you guys today. All right. So you all know modern software development has pretty much become like this. So to illustrate the concepts and technologies that we are going to discuss today, we have prepared a live demo uh, throughout the talk. So let's get started. Our title of our talk is quite a mouthful, and it seems like we put in a lot of buzzwords together. So let's unpack a little and see what they are so that we are all on the same page. So first is Cloud Native. So it is a concept of building and running applications to take advantage of distributed computing that the cloud providers are offering. By doing this, your applications can have the scalability, elasticity, resiliency, and flexibility. The next term is serverless. Serverless is a way of developing and running applications on someone else's server. So you don't have to worry about the provisioning, scaling, maintenance of the server resources. Serverless applications are event-driven, meaning they respond to requests or triggers that are coming from users, devices, or any other services. Um, serverless are, can be auto-scaled. So as you see in this picture, this octopus is using its arms as needed to do this. Serverless can also auto-scale on its own based on the demand that's coming. And the third one, polyglot, which is multi-tongue. It is like having programming, if it is like having a tool in your toolbox to use for a different task. For example, you can create your front end in a language that is more suitable for that or some other language in the back end that allows you to be more flexible and adaptable. Knative is more than serverless. Now, what do I mean by that? You know, when you are in Kubernetes world, you have to keep track and create a lot of constructs, configure them and keep track of. What Knative does is it takes away all this uh, cognitive toil from you and from a container, create a Knative service with the ready to use URL and auto LS, auto TLS, and that scales on demand. So automatic scale on demand for cloud native containers. Another thing serverless does is it's a serverless platform because the auto scaling happens based on demand, but it also goes back down to zero. So it is a serverless platform for Kubernetes. And because of all this, we say Knative is a simplified Kubernetes for application developers. But that's not all. It is also an event-driven platform for Kubernetes because we provide lots of eventing infrastructure and we are going to see it in our talk today. So what I say in the end is Knative when you can and Kubernetes when you must. Architecture evolution. So we have been, and you, as you all are developers, we have been in this world and we see monolithics, microservices, and functions. And I'm not here to talk to you about this one is bad and this one is magically solve all your issues because that's not true. It might depend on your use cases, but everything has its pros and cons. But in one line, I would, I would define my monoliths as a self-contained software where basically everything runs in the same process. And as you can see, what are the pros and cons over there? And microservices we can define as um, multiple, loosely coupled independent services. So they give you more flexibility, a little bit more scalability and easier maintainability. And then comes functions, which are single purpose code, event-driven, ephemeral unit of code that runs on demand. In reality, your application and solution is probably gonna be a mix of all of these. And we are going to see in our demo today. So our demo is a place where you can buy cool stuff from Red Hat, and it's actually called Cool Stuff Store. And it, it ex exists in real life, so if you are ever looking for Red Hat swag, please go buy yeah, it there. 
But our demo is not the real one. Not the real one. <laughs> All right, so, Shaf, what is the current architecture of our application right now, and what are the challenges we are facing? Yeah, so, so obviously we built up a scenario, right? I mean, you're, like Nana mentioned, you're developing applications, you see monolith applications, you see some microservices, or you've tried a bit of mix and match between those. Obviously, with, with, with the monolith architecture, and, and I say it, it maybe in the most nicest words, is that it's not a bad architecture per se. It is an architectural choice. It's a pattern that you would use in your application. Obviously, you can run that in VM, you can run it on a container, et cetera, et cetera. But it, it does have some problems. For example, scaling could be an issue based on how the state is being shared, um, CICD processes, autonomy, all of these different things sort of make it difficult for a monolith architecture to proceed. But in our experience, we've also seen some people who've done monolith architecture quite nicely and don't, do not have those dependencies. But obviously, think about a big bucket and everybody has to put things into that bucket before that bucket goes to a release process. Obviously, that sort of stretches your timeline. So if you want to be faster, um, you probably want to look at something else. Um, in, in our architecture, obviously, in the cool store architecture, we have a user interface, which is, um, which is a simple cool store um, a web interface. It has an inventory where we basically taking the inventory of all our products. And then we have a catalog service, which basically um, is, is the products uh, in relation to the inventory that it's offered on the cool store, which you will see in a minute as well. We have a cart service, which is basically the shopping cart, and then the orders and payment, as the name suggests, right? So that's, that's the current monolith architecture, as it is. Okay, so what would you suggest we should do to evolve it a little bit more? I, I won't suggest burning down the house, but yeah, maybe. <laughs> so, um, <clears throat> so obviously, when we look at that sort of the component diagram that we just saw earlier, when we move into microservices, we obviously become more independent. We have a more structured component unit that we are responsible. It has endpoints like maybe a REST endpoint, GraphQL, gRPC, whatever you prefer. Um, and it has its own responsibility or separation of concern, as we would say, it, within that component. So our architecture right now maybe looks like an inventory service, which is based on a nice framework like Quarkus. And if you want to hear more about Quarkus, then come to the Red Hat table later and we'll discuss that. We have a catalog service, which is based on Spring, Spring Boot. Uh, we have a cart service, which has caching. Uh, and then, of course, we have a payment service, which is the Golang uh, service in this case. And we, we have an eventing backbone um, at this point as well. This helps us to be more distributed. This helps us to uh, create code faster. The teams are more smaller, right? And it kind of gives us the benefit to release more often uh, as well. And release more often always has some other problems attached <laughs> to it, but this is not the talk to talk about it, right? Okay. So what about the capacity part? So yeah, so obviously, like a monolith, we put it in a VM or a container or whatever, <laughs> mostly in a VM. The VM is always there. It takes the full capacity. Uh, but when we move to microservices, obviously, we're doing the same sort of thing is that we have a container that's running and that capacity is always full. But what about if my payment service only needs that it should only be up when there are payments? Maybe I'm running a campaign. People come onto my site and um, badly enough, I don't hopefully have a bad bounce rate. But let's just assume that 20 to 30 percent of that traffic is just browsing through my catalogs and interested in that. They're not going to place orders. They're not going to place payments. So what do I do in that case? So we will have components in our architecture that do not always need to be that full capacity at all time. OK. So I see a slide about mix and match. Oh, you already switched the slide. <laughs> That's interesting. So, so yeah, so obviously, in this case, the payment service could be that it's invoked from zero, like it's sleeping. but. It, it's invoked and then it comes up, the container comes up, and that would be something like you would use in Knative. Obviously, we've sort of like trimmed this demo down for, for the duration of this talk, and we are going to focus on the eventing part of this, so which means that whenever events are received, uh, our service will come up um, and start to, uh, start to work within the process as well. And I'll show that to you uh, in the demo. Yeah. Is the demo time? Right. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. So. I hope you can see my screen. Um, I'm running this on an OpenShift cluster. 
Um, I'm running my source code in my dev spaces around here. I'm not going to be able to go through the entire source code, but happy to, to discuss that after the talk. Um, <clears throat> so here you see I have my Kafka cluster running on OpenShift. Uh, I have my cart service. Um, I have my inventory service. So if I look at the inventory, all the products are there um, in my inventory. Um, I go into my catalog of the Spring Boot service also has my catalog, all the details there. So basically, they're running, they're, they're looking fine. And then I have my Node.js front end and an order service as well, which is backed by MongoDB in this case. So a bit of mix and match of all those things. What I've done, obviously, is I've taken out the Golang service right now for the purpose of this demo, and I put in a payment service. And this payment service is over here, you can see, is a key native function, which is running on its first revision at this point. It has a Kafka source, which means that it's going to receive a Kafka event and then it's going to start up and, and process the payments and take it back to the order. So the way it works is, let's go and take a look. I'm going to go in. I have my, um, my cool store, really, really cool. This is not the production cool store. This is a demo <laughs> cool store, let me just remind you. Uh, and the credit card information that you might see is not real. Anyways, so I add something to my cart and it's, it's being added. You know, there's tons of stuff I could just keep on going. But then when I go to the carts, I see my cart over here. Um, and obviously this is going through the cart service, which is using caching in the background, which is the data grid or InfiniSpan project. I want to check out at this point and let's just assume I want to put in um, a, 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 for payment a credit card. So I'm just going to do that. Um, and I'm just going to put something dummy in there. Um, and then, oops, I always do this. Let me just take that. And name, uh, card number. You sure it's not the real one? Uh, <laughs> nope. <laughs> OK, let's say Chicago this time. Um, and I check out, right? So when I check out, it goes into the orders. In the orders, it's processing. But if I also go like what's happened is that the cart service, as soon as that happened, sent a message out to, um, to, my, um, uh, to the orders you can see over here, for example. Um, and then I go back, for example, and I see that my payment service has also been enacted. So maybe let's look at that because as soon as the payment is processed, it's going to soon die out. It received the payment from a Kafka message from orders. Um, and then obviously it just checked it and sent it. And what we are doing is pretty simple in this demo code is that we wait for five seconds and after five seconds we say, okay, the payment is processed. Such an easy process, we should all have that, right? So easy to do that. But obviously the eventing happens. Um, the event is received on the payment from the orders through the Kafka topic, which is called the orders. Once that's done, it's processed and it goes on. So I have one instance of Knative eventing running here, but then what if, what if there were multiple instances and this, this was supposed to scale as an example, right? So I go into my simulator, which I've just written a very rudimentary simulator, but I can actually just say, I want to do some random orders, right? And over here, I'm just going to create 100 orders, which basically is going to call the cart API um, and, and put something in the cart and call the checkout process. Once it does that, I expect that it's going to send 100 messages into the Kafka um, topic, which is the orders topic, and then the whole system will start to roll. So here's some nice names and etc. Um, and we can see that these, you know, 100 uh, things are, are created. When I go into my cart, for example, I look at the logs, I can see that almost all 100 have been sent. So they have been sent uh, to the Kafka topic, which is orders. Um, and if I go into my orders here, um, and look at the logs of the orders as well. And this is just one instance is running. They have also pretty much, you can see, sent all the, um, all the 100 ones. But if I go in back to my cool store, I can see that in my orders, some are completed, very few, and some are processing, right? So it's synchronously happening that it's receiving, the payment service is receiving an event, and it's synchronously processing. And every time it receives an event, it's, uh, it's basically waiting our, our awesome check process for, for five seconds. Um, if I look at the payment logs here, I can see that as well is that, yes, there is some activity, but this is not 100 Kafka messages that are being received. And the reason is because this is, this is purely synchronous 
And what's it doing is, if I go back again and see that there's only, um, there's only one pod running at this time. So it's synchronously handling everything that's coming in. So obviously, when you are, when you're creating a, an architecture and you're using uh, eventing as an example, there is something that's happening that you're sort of also creating a little bit of bottleneck for cases where it's not an HTTP request. If it was an HTTP request, obviously it would scale, but in this case we have events, so how do we do that? Yeah, do Did you I have a tag you? for that? <laughs> yeah, sure, I hope so. Yeah, do you have a tag for that? So yeah, so, so basically... This is, the, you just showed us the event-driven. I just showed you the event-driven. Event -driven. Yeah, so there's, yeah. So this is what we're looking at. It's the, it's the top part of it, right? So we created the eventing system, the Kafka message came in, um, the pod was scheduled, the payment uh, service pod, and then obviously it sort of like did its stuff and then went on. But what if, what if you have multiple events and you want to make sure that maybe, in my case, my code is so nice that it waits for five seconds. <laughs> so in that case, like what, what happens if I want to be able to use multiple of the uh, pods in this case or multiple functions to take care of it rather than just this one. And if I need different eventing mechanisms to do that, not just with Kafka. So what, how would we do that? Yeah, in that case... Yeah. All of us want to order for our family, friends, and neighbors. So <laughs> what are yeah. you going to do? <laughs> exactly. So, so you could use something like Keda, which is a Kubernetes event-driven auto-scaling. It provides 61 built-in scalers. And obviously, it's nice that you can see these metrics coming in or events coming in, and you can actually scale. So let's see how would that differ uh, in our cool store application. So, oops, wrong application. That's my backup server, by the way. Um, so let me just log out. And obviously, I have two different namespaces where I am doing this. You know, I forgot the password. Just kidding. <laughs> OK. So same structure here, same thing same environment, but this time I'm using the operator for Keda, right? And I'm basically going to receive all of the events uh, through the system as well. So if I show you again, and I'm just going to do that here, <clears throat> it's the same cool store. Um, there's no orders. There's nothing in the card, etc., etc. But this time, what we'll do right away is that uh, we will maybe try to create a couple of orders, again, through the simulator. And this time, I'm going to be a little bullish, and I'm going to throw 1,000 orders instead of 100, right? So as soon as I do that, I can see that over here, the payment service has started scheduling, and you can see that the pods have already increased to 10. And pretty much that's the capacity I've set. So obviously, I can set capacity as to the maximum level of serverless functions I want to run. Uh, in this case, it's running 10 pods, so that's the maximum capacity. But then the benefit of this is that if I go back to my uh, microservice, uh, to, to my Node.js, I can see that some of the orders are completed, but you can also see that they're randomly being completed, right? This wasn't the case before. Before, they were just going synchronously. Here, they're able to go as asynchronously because I have multiple capacity that's running. So if I look at the, the card service logs here, for example, then <clears throat> they should have sent all the 1,000 messages. And it seems like, yeah, it seems like the card has sent all the messages to the topic as well. If I go into the orders, uh, it's pretty similar as well. Uh, should be, yes, there's a lot of, lot of log here. So that's also done. But obviously, you might ask like, oh, well, payment service is not super fast at this time. The payment service is obviously not super fast because I'm waiting on each order, I'm waiting five seconds. But the, what's happened in this case is that the payment service is able to take the same load rather than doing it synchronously with one pod. Now I'm able to do the same thing with 10 pods. So and I'm it. a little confused, Shaf. So yeah. you talked about Knative service scaling, and then you talked about Keda scaling. Yes. Right. Which one is getting scaled by what? So obviously, that's something very interesting. Let me go back to the slides. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So the payment service that we deployed as Knative service is getting scaled up how the events are coming. 
But what about a lot of external systems are sending a lot of events and we want to scale up the events themselves and that's where we are going to use KEDA. The applications that you have deployed would be using Knative and it would be automatically auto-scaling depending upon how events are coming in. We have a five minute warning, so let's yep. speed up a little. Um, but I think the, the uh, yeah, sorry. You know, it's okay. There you go. I do want to talk about that while scaling thing that we have seen. Uh, what does it actually give you? And it's the efficiency. If you are not doing the auto scaling, you are going to suffer from either under provisioning or auto provisioning since you are doing the capacity planning based on the CPU, memory, and all that. And the demand that comes in is going to vary. And with serverless, with Knative, uh, you can actually make it pretty evenly matched up. And that's what you get because it is going to scale up depends on the demand. So if I, if I may just yeah, add one more point quickly, like we have a lot of these business critical systems that are running, maybe they're in Java, for example, et cetera. And a lot of times you're writing this code where an application is just gonna receive an event and it's gonna interact with that event and then it's gonna finish up that task. And that's a super nice use case where you actually do not need the capacity to just keep on running all the time. You just want to do it, do it ad hoc. When that event comes in, the service yes. should come up, service that event, and then, and then die later. So it's a very good use case when we talk about modernization, especially in integration scenarios as well. I am going to talk about functions because we cannot say the word serverless and not mention functions. So we are running out of time, so I will just mention that Knative functions, you can actually just in two steps, create from your code and just deploy it. We provide you the templates in out of the boxes runtime. You do not have to wrangle with HTTP libraries, HTTP servers, just bring your business logic and deploy it on the code. So all this create, deploy, it is run locally, and container build all is done by the Knative functions itself. Uh, that's the command down there, and uh, I think there is one more. So yeah, where do we find your demolition script? <laughs> so this link would take you to the demo script, and we would be uploading our slides after, after the talk, so uh, you will have this. And this is our in conclusion. I wanted to leave you all with this. So this is a five hour model that you can use as a roadmap to navigate your migration journey of modernizations. You, there is no one way of doing this. You, depending upon where you are, you start where, right? So first is rehost. If you already have a containerized application, there is no rewrite necessary. Just deploy them using Knative, right? Uh, then in refactor, try to see what applications you can containerize or start using cloud native technologies, for example, Service Mesh to use the platform wide observability and uh, network. The another is a re revise, and this is where you can see what applications you can decouple using the event driven pattern that we have shown. And the same thing with rebuild is all your new applications that you are building, see if you can do containerized and in 12 factor app fashion, or consider functions for even faster uh, iteration to market. And the last one is replace. Depending upon as needed, you can decommission whatever legacy part you do not need and keep the one that you need. And that's how you can modernize with step-by-step -step and pick where you are. So I hope it's as easy as that Gopher is telling us. But thank you so much. That's, that's all. But oh, we do have a Knative kiosk in the pavilion. Drop in there. Uh, the P5A is our number. Uh, chat about, about our demo and the stuff that we are not able to cover. We would be uh, really happy to see you all. And please, please, please scan the QR code and leave feedback for Knative or for the talk. We would love to have the feedback on our talk. I do not think we have time for q &A. All right. And we already talked about the Red Hat booth. We have some cool swag. So come and talk to us there. Thank you so much for your attention and hope you have a great day.